Last Sunday, we introduced uh, Paul's letter to Titus, and this Sunday, we're going to really get into the text. So go ahead and open up your Bibles to the first chapter of the book of Titus and, and be ready for that in your, in your Bibles that are in the chairs. It's page 965, just to help you get there. A gentleman was, was at the breakfast table. It was Sunday morning. He was still in his pajamas, eating his cereal, and it's getting later in the morning. His wife came into uh, the table, and she said, Honey, you better hurry up. It's almost time to leave for church. And he said, I'm not going to church today. She said, Well, why not? So, well, in the first place, I don't like a single person up in that place. And secondly, there's not a person up there that likes me. She said, well, honey, you know that God has taught us we need to go to church. Secondly, you're the preacher. <laughs> now, listen, anybody and everybody have had times when they were down on the church. I talk to people like that all the time. Frankly, it is not a sign of your intelligence or talent to be able to find fault in the church. I regularly talk to people who want to find fault in the church, even in our church, and they usually will do it by saying something along these lines. How wonderful it is from the church that they came from, that they used to go to. Funny thing is, I usually know the preacher of the church that they used to go to. And when you talk to him, he will say he spent the entire week talking to people who told him how bad his church was. So it doesn't matter where you are or who you are. Somebody can find a problem in the closest church. Somebody once said the church is like Noah's Ark. If it wasn't for the storm on the outside, you couldn't stand the stench on the inside. The church is made up of sinners. So if you can't find fault with the church, then you're not trying very hard. And nobody knew that more than the Apostle Paul. He could sit for hours and talk to you about problems in churches that he had been to. And yet it's interesting to me that when Paul did mission work, he never was interested in evangelizing just so that someone could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He never stopped there. He never said, okay, now you know Jesus, you know Jesus, that's all we need. No, you see, he would take these people that he converted and then he wanted to form them into a church. And he formed them in every town he ever went to, including Crete. So he writes a young missionary on that island in the Mediterranean because he's concerned that in every town on Crete, there be strong, active churches. And he starts his letter like this, reading from the very first verse of the book of Titus. Titus 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who doesn't lie, promised before the beginning of time. And in his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Now, as I read that introduction several times over, I was struck by that phrase for the faith of God's elect. Everything that Paul is going to write and tell Titus to do in this letter is for the sake of the elect. Now, we don't have time today to develop a full-scale theology of election, but let me just say that when you read that word elect in your Bible, it usually refers to the relationship that God has with those who are saved. 
And it is not intended as a statement about individual choice. In other words, God doesn't violate individual free will. He does not elect one person to be saved and one person to be lost, indiscriminate of their personal choices. Jesus said, unless you believe, you are going to die in your sins. You have the responsibility to choose or to reject Jesus. But God does elect, choose, to have a community, a people of saved believers for his own, he always has. That is our very first point. God wants a people that are uniquely his. Now, know that all the people in the world and everything in the world already belongs to God, but God wants a people out of all the peoples of the earth that are uniquely his. Now, in the Old Testament, this unique people was called Israel. Just before they entered into the promised land, Moses reminds the people of these words. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Now, God loved all the people of the earth, but God has special plans for a people to be his people to reach the whole earth. In the Old Testament, that people were the people of Israel. In the New Testament, that people is the new Israel, the church. So we read over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now look down to a few verses later to verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you see that God wants a people to be uniquely his? God is anxious to produce communities of believers who are readily identifiable in a special sense as his people. Does God own all the people of Des Moines? Of course he does. But does God want in Des Moines a special people uniquely his, easily identifiable as his people? Yes, he does. Why? Why does God want his own people? You read in the second chapter of Titus, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Why does God want a people? Well, according to Titus chapter 2 that finally showed up on the screen, one reason is that God wants someone to demonstrate godly living. God wants a people that will show all the people how to say no to sin and yes to good living. God wants a people that will do that. God also wants a people that can demonstrate to the world how to live In community, we human beings are very strange creatures. We can't live without community and we can't live in community very well. 
We can't live by ourselves. We need to be connected. So we marry. We have kids. We live in neighborhoods, in villages. We make friends. And then we break off our marriages. We send away our kids. We send off our friends. We live fractured lives. Not knowing how to truly live in community. And God wants a people that can show the world how it is that we need to live in community. And I also think, according to Titus chapter 2, that there is a grace that has appeared. There is hope in Jesus Christ. God wants a people that can show that to the world. So you can put down the church. I'm the first one to admit that the church has flaws. But you need to be careful around me being critical of the church. Because Paul said in Titus chapter 2 in the church that God is doing this work of purifying and making for himself a people that are his very own. So, So be careful that you respect the elect. Which leads me to my second point. And that is building the church cooperates with the purposes of God. God is active in the church, purifying people to become his own. But that doesn't mean that there is nothing to do for us. Paul didn't say to Titus, you know what? God's at work in in Crete building churches. So Titus, just stay out of his way. No, Paul wanted Titus to be active in Crete. He wanted him to teach. He wanted him to help mature people. He wanted him to appoint elders because when When that is being done, you are joining with God in the task of creating a special people. I think today too many are individualized in their thinking. They want God, but they don't want the people that God wants to build. Someone once asked Winston Churchill if he was a pillar in the church. And he replied, no, I'm more of a flying buttress. A flying buttress is a support that is on the outside. Of the church. And I suppose that's what a lot of people want to do. They, they want to support the church from the outside. They don't want to be on the inside doing the work involved in what God is trying to do. I want you to know today you're looking at someone who's fully committed and convicted by the power of the local church. I am asked by people, what are my goals? I'm asked even after 18 years of being in this pulpit, am I just using this as a stepping stone to something else? You need to know that I am doing the most important work there is to do on the earth. I am helping cooperate with God in building the church. Creating a people that he can call his own. There is nothing else on earth more important than that. The ministry of the gospel requires that when we bring people to Jesus Christ, we we introduce them to a fellowship of believers that take seriously the fact that they are God's very own people in a specific community. It excited Paul to write to Titus and say, Titus, if you do your work well, do you realize That in every town in Crete, you are going to be able to identify God's people. That is what God wants. In every nation, in every tongue, in every tribe, in every village, God wants you to be able to find his people. And you can find them. You can find them today just like you can find them on Crete because the same characteristics are still relevant. Paul mentions four things that identify the chosen, the elect of God. First, they are a people of faith. Paul said, I am, in verse 1, a servant of God and an apostle for the faith of God's elect. Now, that means two things. It means that they they know what it means to be justified by faith and they know what it means to live by faith. First, first on that is that they know God's people know what it is to be justified by faith. God's people do not talk a lot of nonsense about how they are. They're going to be right with God because they're doing their very best. That's how most of America talks. You, You read any Gallup poll Most Americans will say, yes, I believe in God. Yes, I'm going to go to heaven because I try. I'm doing my best. The elect never talk like that. 
The elect know that they are right with God, not because they are a choice people like some cut of meat, but because they have been chosen, holy, undeserved, by grace. They are not going to be right with God because they're doing their best. They're going to be right with God because in faith they have received the grace offer of Jesus Christ. Remember, Peter said, once you were a people who had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God's people have received mercy, and that is our only basis for standing before him. Titus writes, or Paul writes to Titus in the third chapter. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating each other. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. How do you identify God's people? They're justified by faith, not by merit. Also, God's people live by faith. They, they live their lives in, in such a way that God is actually relevant. I don't think most people in America do that today. Now, Gallup will tell you most Americans say they believe in God. Most Americans don't live like God is relevant. The noted scholar Carl Henry once wrote, A disconcerting wide segment of American society succumbs to the premise That life has not come from God, does not move toward God, and cannot be enriched by God. Is that true of the people that you work with? Most of your neighbors? They may say they believe in God, but they don't live like life comes from God. They don't live like life is going to God. They don't live like life can be enriched by God. For most people, God is just a a convenience that you put up on a shelf in your closet because someday you might need to pull him out and use him. How do you know how to find the elect? They live by faith. They let every area of their life revolve around God. Now that makes them a little strange. Most people think they're kind of kooky. Why don't you just put God in the closet like the rest of us do and and pull him out when it's appropriate to do so? But the elect talk, live, breathe God. And that's one way you can spot them. They are a people of faith, but also they are a people of knowledge. Paul says in that in that first verse again, I am a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth. The elect have their facts right about the truth of God. They have taken time to learn their theology. And I know today most people don't want to take time to learn theology. Most people would much rather be experience-oriented than knowledge-oriented. And there is room in the religious life for experience. But the gospel is truth from God, and it has to be thought out before you can try it out. So Paul says, the elect are people that have a knowledge of the truth. God's own people have a deep hunger to know him more. I read a story once about Elizabeth Barrett Browning, one of America's most famous poets. As a young girl, she was in an accident and she lived a semi-invalid life for the rest of her days. And her father was almost tyrannical in his protection of his daughter. So when she met this young, struggling poet named Robert Browning, and then she fell in love, 
her father was very much against that relationship. In fact, they snuck away, they eloped, and they got married. And her father absolutely opposed the union. They eventually sailed to Italy to live. And Elizabeth spent the rest of her life trying to to rebuild the bridge to her father. She wrote her father a letter every week to repair that broken bridge. Ten years after she had married Robert, she got a big box from America and she opened up the box and inside of that box was every single one of the letters she wrote to her father unopened. And today, those letters are considered some of the most beautiful and classic English literature. But they were never read by the one they were meant for. Let me tell you something about God's people. They have read his letters. They live in his letters. They, they, they read it like it is the most beautiful love story ever composed because it is. And they hunger to know more about the love of their father. They know that people matter to God because they have a knowledge of the truth. They they know God. And I'll tell you something else about the chosen. There are people of faith. There are people of knowledge. And they are a people of godliness. Because Paul said that the faith of God's elect, the knowledge of the truth, that leads to godliness. Paul believes that if you really know the truth, if you really study the scriptures, if you really know God, it's going to produce a a holy living in you. Now, the problem in Crete, as we will see, there's a lot of teaching going on. That's not so much heretical as it is irrelevant People are arguing, they're debating about stuff, and no one's profiting from it. Paul said, I I don't have use for Bible study if it doesn't shape people into the image of Christ. God wants a people that are his very own. People who are eager to do what is good, he said. God wants his own people to live godly lives. That's why any doctrine that permits sin is not a Bible doctrine. Any doctrine that allows us to not live godly lives is not a real knowledge of the truth. God's people are a people of faith. God's people are a people of knowledge. God's people are a people that are godly. Paul writes in the first chapter of Ephesians, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. God wants people that are godly. So Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Well, how do you identify God's people? There are people of faith. There are people of knowledge. They live good lives. Also, they are a people of hope. Paul said, there is a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life. Let me tell you about that word hope in the Bible. The word hope in the Bible does not mean hope so That's how you and I use the word. I might say, I I sure hope that the Vikings will win, even though we know that's a a false belief. (laughs) We're saying, I hope so. But in the Bible, the word hope means expectation. When Paul says God's people are are faithful, they know what they believe, they are godly, they hope in eternal life. What he's saying is they expect it. They are planning on it. They are counting on it. They are ready for it. Do you, do you know why they have hope? 
Well, what is our hope? Our blessed hope is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We expect it. God's people expect Jesus is coming back. He's going to claim his people as his own. He's going to take them to their heavenly home. They live their life down here with their eyes on life up there. They constantly make investments with an eternal perspective. Even the most mundane things of earth are touched with the glory of heaven when God's people do them. So are you beginning to see why we should respect the elect? This is why I want you to be numbered among them. Let me give you a challenge this morning, a challenge that if you want to be one of God's people, we need to understand that God's people value, excuse me, his community. If you are one of God's people, you value the community that God owns. You ever notice the value of something is determined by the owner of something. Look up at the screen at this picture. These, these locks of, of hair braids, they belonged to Willie Nelson, who apparently is still alive after reports of his demise on Facebook. In October of 2014, these two hair braids were sold at auction for $37,000. I'd be willing to grow my hair and braid it and sell it for 1000 bucks. That's a steal in my book. Why would anybody pay $37,000 for two locks of hair? Because it belonged to Willie Nelson. You see, the value of something is determined by the owner. You belong to God. How much do you think you are worth? How valuable are the rest of the people in this room to you? What would you sacrifice for the others in this room? What would you give up so that you could be with the people in this room every chance you had? It is special to be one of God's people. You value God's community if you are one of God's people. Also, God's people maintain their identity. They know who they are and they refuse to be anything else. At baptism, our, our citizenship was literally transferred to a new kingdom. We live in the world now as aliens and strangers. We've got this tough balancing act to do. On one hand, you have people that say we need confinement. The idea is that we, we are in the world, but we're going to confine ourselves from the world and build up big walls and live as far away from the world as we can. That's not what God wants. On the other extreme, you have conformity. The idea is that, well, we are in the world, so we just become like the world. We need to look like everybody else. Just go to church every once in a while. That's not what God wants either. We're going to stay right in the middle of the world, but we're not going to act like the world. We're not going to be like the world. We're going to be different from the world. And we're not going to apologize for it because we are God's people. And we know that the only way the world will realize it is lost, it needs to be redeemed, is to strike hard against an alternative that they can see in our life. So we get together often and, and we meet and, and we worship and we remind each other of our unique role in the world as God's very own people. And finally, God's people live for eternity. You ever been a tourist in another country? I mean, if you're just going to stay for a few days, you don't bother to learn the customs. That's why we don't practice the customs of this world. We're pilgrims. We are aliens. This isn't our home. We're not planning on settling here. Our, our hope, not our hope so, our expectation is that Jesus Christ is going to come soon and gather up all of God's people and take us to our real home. And so we live for eternity. The question of the morning is, is it hard to identify God's people? Pat Kelly, who became an evangelist, he used to play professional baseball for the Baltimore Orioles. He passed away in the year 2005. 
His manager was the fiery Earl Weaver. One day he came into Earl's office and he said, Weave, sure is good to walk with Jesus. Without bothering even to look up, the manager said, Well, that's nice, but I'd really wish you'd learn to walk with the bases loaded. <laughs> Two totally different kind of people. It's not hard to identify one of God's people, and it's not hard to identify one who is not. The question I'm going to leave you with this morning is this. How would your non-Christian friends and neighbors identify you? And we're going to sing a song. And this is not a song from the world. This is a song from people who belong to the Lord, who have a hope, who have faith in him. And if you want to be one of God's people, then then you can come and you can join us. You can, you can transfer your citizenship through baptism into Jesus Christ. You can do it today. How do you see this old world? Oh, how do you soak it all in? Oh, where did you come from and why are you here? And what does it all really mean? Am I just here to make money, or die in the vain quest for peace? How can I find out if there's truth in the world, or shall I just live as I please? I've been told that Jesus is the answer, Jesus is the way, Jesus is the only been told that Jesus is the truth that all the world needs to know. The one in whom consists all things is the one who loves me so.